so we were discussing the, the production of sperm, the process called spermatic, spermatogenesis. And I basically gave you the beginning of that process. It starts out out here at the edge of the seminiferous tubule with an undifferentiated cell that's called a spermatogonium. This is a cell that is diploid. Do you remember what diploid meant? Two sets of chromosomes. So we're going to take that undifferentiated cell. And that undifferentiated cell is going to go through a series of cellular divisions. We're going to start out first with mitosis. So the spermatogonium undergoes mitosis. And really, we have a population of spermatogonium that are going to enter into this process from a greater population or a larger population. Now, mitosis, if you think back to some of the stuff that we've already discussed, mitosis always ends with the same number of chromosomes in the original cell. It's just the process where we can multiply additional cells. So if we take a single spermatogonia, and we send it through mitosis, we split that cell into now two new daughter cells. We have two additional cells, and we're going to call those two primary spermatocytes. So from our spermatogonium, one of them will divide and form two primary spermatocytes. These cells are still both diploid. So if we're talking about humans, how many chromosomes are present in these primary spermatocytes? We're going to have 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. Continuing down this idea of cellular division, we're now going to take these spermatocytes, these primary spermatocytes, and we're going to undergo meiosis. And you'll remember that meiosis is the process by which we divide a cell, we get new cells, but each of these cells has half as many chromosomes as the original cell. So the primary spermatocyte is going to undergo our two stages of meiosis. Meiosis 1, and as we go through meiosis 1, which you can see happening here, from primary spermatocyte through meiosis 1, we end up with two cells called secondary spermatocytes. So one primary spermatocyte becomes two secondary. That's supposed to be a little hash mark right there. So two secondary spermatocytes. At the end of meiosis one, we're really only halfway through the mitotic process of three meiosis. And so these two cells are still actually going to have 46 chromosomes each. So the remaining difference. So we still have those 46 chromosomes. But if you are keeping track here from our original spermatogonium, how many, how many chromosomes in this original cell? Okay, so 46. And then I go through mitosis to form my two primary spermatocytes. How many chromosomes do I have in each of those cells? 46. So how many total chromosomes do I have? from that division. In each cell I have 46, I now have 92. Okay, So I got a total of 92 cells that again divide. And now I really have for each primary spermatocyte, two secondary spermatocyte. So if we kind of go back and track from the spermatogonium, I go from 1 to 2, 2 to 4. 1 to 2, 2 to 4. And now I got 46 plus 46 plus 46 plus 46, which is 184, right? 82, 184. So there's 184 chromosomes contained between four different cells by this end of this first meiosis stage. We're 
going to finish off meiosis. We're going to go through that second mitotic stage, meiosis two. And from each of those individual diploid secondary spermatocytes, so from each of our secondary spermatocytes, we're going to create two cells called spermatid. So two spermatids. Now, at the end of meiosis two, what's the what's the unique thing that happens with our chromosomes? They split. So now I go from having 46 chromosomes to 23 chromosomes in each of the cells that are formed. So these cells are now called haploid, as opposed to diploid. Haploid just simply means that it's one set of chromosomes rather than two sets of chromosomes. So each cell now contains 23. Do you remember how many chromosomes we had before we went through meiosis 2 across all of our four different cells? 184. Those 184 chromosomes have now been distributed into how many cells? I went from 8. I went from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8. And when I went from 4 to 8, I didn't have additional chromosomes that were produced. I didn't have any synthesis of DNA. So then we had to divide them up. And they get evenly distributed 23 chromosomes of those 184. 8 times 23 is 184. So now each of these cells I produce from a single spermatogonium, eight of these spermatids, each of them halfway containing 23 chromosomes. Once we get to this, this point, so here are my spermatid cells here. They still are round. They don't really look like the sperm itself. They don't have the flagella and the flagellar motor, the acrosome, which is a capsule that sits at the nose of the sperm cell that only allows human sperm to, um, to fertilize human ovum. So they haven't fully gone through maturation. We've differentiated. We've taken one, and we've produced now eight. Now the rest of the process is called maturation. We're going to take those individual spermatid, and we're going to mature them into mature sperm. So in one sense, you can kind of think of spermatogenesis as having two different two different parts. You have sort of this productional differentiation part, and then we're going to have the second maturation part. And during maturation, the cell is going to go through the, the spermatid is going to go through this process of developing additional structures. There are now going to be proteins that are turned on that help to uh, to flesh out this, this maturation process. So what we really produced at the end of meiosis II was uh, what's called an early spermatid. It's just a type of spermatid, but it's early because it hasn't gone through any maturation. And sort of the process here is to go from early to late, and then from late spermatid to immature sperm, And then from our immature sperm, finally to our mature sperm. So there's the, the cell lineage, if you will, for the maturation process. This process of going from early spermatid to mature sperm typically takes between 9 and 10 weeks. And from our single spermatogonium, that's an undifferentiated cell, within about 9, 10 weeks, you're going to have eight mature sperm produced from each of those single cells. Now, this process of maturation, going from early spermatid to mature sperm, is supported by some other cells. And you actually can see some of those cells sort of in the backgrounds of these pictures. There are two additional types of cells that are found in the spermatogonium. 
one of those cells are called Sartoli cells. And the Sartoli cells are going to support the maturation process. And they support the maturation process by providing nutrients and waste removal capabilities to keep those cells in an environment conducive to go from early spermatid to mature sperm. So sort of the big summary here from our one spermatogonium, which is the cell that again typically is up here at the periphery of the seminiferous tubule, and we move our way down towards the lumen as we go through this differentiation and maturation process from that single spermatogonium we produce eight mature sperm cells. Eight mature sperm cells. Now this entire process from spermatogonium to mature sperm, it needs to be regulated, right? And if you really think about it, prior to puberty, there's probably no reason to expend energy on this process. So part of the uh, maturation process for the organism during puberty is to begin to set up the regulatory system for sperm production. And sperm production is actually going to begin all in your head. Or at least the guys in here, it's all in your head first. And what I mean by that is it's actually an endocrine axis. We've already gone over endocrine axes before. We're going to be dealing with the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis. This is going to be a hormonally regulated process. Why does it make sense to be hormonally regulated rather than nervous system regulated? It's a long amount of time. We're talking nine, ten weeks that the process of maturation occurs over. It's not something that occurs very quickly. So the hormonal regulation is really this idea that certain things and hormones are going to be produced that will help to stimulate taking that spermatogonium to the mature sperm under conducive conditions, under environmental conditions that are conducive for the production of these cells. So we want to do it when it's energetically favorable. If you had to guess a hormone that regulates this process, what would you probably guess? Yeah, definitely testosterone. So testosterone is a very important control over spermatogenesis, and specifically it's going to control the rate of production. The rate of production. So testosterone is released, it's stimulated to be released, initially from hormones that are released here in the pituitary. So we have, at the very beginning, gonadotropin releasing hormone, GnRH. So hypothalamic hormone. GnRH is going to be released onto the anterior pituitary. So this hormone releases interacts with cells of the anterior pituitary called gonadotrophs. Gonadotrophs are the cells that produce what are called gonadotropins. The gonadotropins include LH, which is luteinizing hormone, and FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone. So LH and FSH are going to be released from the anterior pituitary from a signal from hypothalamically produced GnRH. So luteinizing hormone comes down and it interacts with cells called the interstitial cells. These are the other types of cells that are present inside of the seminiferous tubule. They're just cells that surround or are in the interstitium of the seminiferous tubule. Notice that LH comes down, interacts through the LH receptor with these interstitial, um, interstitial cells, and testosterone is going to begin to be produced. 
So testosterone begins to enter into the bloodstream. You'll notice that we have some feedback. We get high levels of testosterone. We actually want to turn off the production of the luteinizing hormone because we don't want to continue to produce a hormone that we already have in abundance. But we also have this effect where testosterone goes off to other tissues, muscles. Um, I believe some of the regulation of physical activity is through testosterone as well. So that's what's going on here. Testosterone goes off to other tissues, feeds back onto the anterior pituitary in a negative feedback loop, and then also ends up going down here into the um, or really surrounding the um, interstitial cells to the uh, seminiferous tubule, other cells in the seminiferous tubule. This hormone right here, or I'm uh, sorry, this molecule right here, ADP, stands for androgen binding protein. Testosterone is going to bind to this androgen binding protein, and it forms a complex that can interact in particular with the uh, spermatog spermatogonium to begin that process. So you need that interaction to occur for the spermatogonians in mitosis, meiosis one, meiosis two, and maturation. It's also going to interact with those Sartoli cells. So by producing that testosterone and the androgen binding protein complex, testosterone affects maturation, The maturation process from a perspective of how quickly this is going to occur. And it also is going to influence <coughs> the Sertoli cells to cause the Sertoli cells to function in a way that is conducive to support the spermatogenic process. Okay, so maturation rate increases, Sertoli cell function increases to support that process of spermatogenesis. Again, that testosterone stimulated by the anterior pituitary, especially by luteinizing hormone. Testosterone is produced by the interstitial cells that we find in the tubules. produced by the interstitial cells in the tubules. And then again, the regulatory axis that you're looking at here. Can properly be called the hypothalamic pituitary testicular or gonadal Testicular or gonadal axis. There's a multiple. And the main function of this in males, this hypothalamic pituitary gonadal or testicular axis, is to regulate the amount of testosterone that is present for the organism. Aim to regulate blood testosterone levels. Now, ladies, every 28 days, you go through a cycle that stems from the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian or gonadal axis in the female. And it's probably not always that much fun, but you should have sympathy for the guys. Because this regulatory mechanism, the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis, is every 24 hours for us. Basically, it's not that bad. In fact, it's really not anything at all. But that 24 hour cycle is high levels of sperm production, low levels of sperm production, as we go through sort of a pulsatile rather than a cyclical pattern. Females go through that cyclical 28-day pattern. We're actually going to talk about what that looks like. Males go through a pulsatile pattern, where testosterone is released in pulses. And as testosterone is released in those 24-hour pulses, you have kind of a time period when spermatogenesis occurs. 
And usually it's when you have low um, energy requirements for other organ systems. Or at the So, ladies, she said, so 24 hours. Do you imagine every 24 hours? It's not the only time to get the All right. Um, any questions on mail reproductive systems? I know that was really, really quick, but I'm going to shift gears and we're not going to take a look at the mail reproductive system. So this is a cross-sectional view of the female reproductive system. And one of the things that really stands out here, beginning from the ovary and leading through the um, fallopian tube or the oviduct into the uterus and then to the vaginal canal, is it's a system of tubes. So we have another tubular system. My notes are a little weird here. I'm not sure what happened. This number four tubular system is female reproductive system, and now we're going to go through that and wrap it in the show on this figure. The tubular system that exists. So, this tubular system is designed starting from the ovary all the way through the rest of the system, designed to support, mature, and release the female sexual. Gamete, which is called ovum, or sometimes referred to as the egg. Just to give you a reference, the ovum is actually uh, the largest of the human cells, the mammalian cells. And if you have a textbook or another book, if you look at the period at the end of the sentence, that's roughly the size of the female ovum. So that's a pretty good sized cell compared to a lot of the other cells that we actually looked at. In this tubular system, the female reproductive system releases one to two eggs per cycle. Okay, so one to two eggs per cycle, that cycle is an average 28 day period um, of the menstrual cycle. We're going to start with the ovaries. All right, so this is what you're looking at here. Basically, you've taken the uterus and the oviducts and the um, uh, the ovaries and then the vaginal canal. And we basically dissected that out, and you're looking at it from an anterior perspective. So here in the ovary, this is not really what the inside of the ovary looks like. But what you're looking at here is this cycle of producing a single mature egg during a menstrual period to be released that possibly could be fertilized. And we're going to zoom in on this so you can see this in greater detail. Every textbook that's out there draws it like this as the model, but it's actually the model is really, really bad. Because really what's happening is you have an individual cell at a location someplace within that ovarian tissue that goes through these stages, and they, they just show the stages static and kind of stacked up like that. You've got to think of this as more one point in the ovary, and you sort of have this sequence of events that occurs through a temporal landscape. We're going to get into better detail here in just a second. Um, so just to lay some of the anatomy first, we'll come back to the physiology uh, in a little while. Um, the ovaries are responsible to release the ovum as an OO site. So the ovum is what is produced, and then when it's released, it's called an OO site. That's what actually can be fertilized. The ovary is also responsible to produce two hormones. Those hormones are estrogens 
and progesterones. The estrogens and the progesterones. So these two hormones are going to come back and you're going to see why these are critically important. They both help to regulate not only what's called a um, sexual cycle, which is the form of the menstrual cycle that leads um, to a new cycle, versus a reproductive cycle, which is the form of the menstrual cycle that leads towards successful pregnancy. We're going to see that progesterone is critical to establish a pregnancy and maintain that pregnancy all the way through to arteritis. So it's coming in part from production of those two hormones, estrogen and progesterone, from the ovaries. So that ova, or oocyte as it's released, is released into the pelvic space nearby an opening to this tube-like structure called an oviduct. Oviduct is the proper term, which you probably have heard it referred to as the fallopian tube. Fallopian was a guy who discovered it first characterized it. So the fallopian tube or the uterine duct or the uterine tube, there's a bunch of different names for the same structure. Properly it's the oviduct. So that release oocyte or the egg is going to travel into the oviduct. And how that happens is really radical. And I'm going to talk about all of that in a little bit of detail here shortly. So oviduct again, also um, most commonly referred to in colloquium as the fallopian tube. The released ovum or the released egg is going to be swept in at the very opening here of the oviduct there are these finger-like structures. Those finger-like structures are called the fin bride. So the released egg, as it comes out of the ovum into this area, is swept into the opening of the oviduct with these little finger-like projections called the fin bride. So these are finger-like projections. I'll give you a little bit of a hint. The sweeping motion that's created by the fimbriae to bring the uh, released egg, we're going to talk more about this, but to bring the released egg into the opening of the oviduct. That motion, when ovulation occurs, blood is flushed into those fimbriae. And every time the heart beats, it creates a sweeping motion. So it's synced up with the heart. And it's the heart that pulls that ovum into, into the oviduct and makes it available for fertilization. So from here, the egg is going to travel down the tube of the oviduct to a structure called the uterus. So travel down the fallopian tube. Fertilization, by the way, occurs up here in the upper third of the fallopian tube or the oviduct. So fertilization is going to occur, and as it travels down, if fertilization has occurred, that egg travels down three or four days into the uterus and will implant into that uterine wall, implant into the wall of the uterus. So fertilization occurs in the upper portion of the oviduct. And in that process of traveling from where it's been fertilized to implantation typically takes three to four days. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.
All right, when you come back here on Monday, we'll talk about the years.